Since humans first walked on the earth, we have gazed and wondered at the night sky. And one of the oldest sciences, astronomy, still seeks to answer the fundamental question, what is our place in the universe? Early star watchers realized that most of the stars moved together across the sky, but others went their own way. These were called the wandering stars, an ancient Greek planistai, the planets. Through history, people have found many ways to explain the mystery of the night sky. Some imagine that it was a blanket with holes that let in the light of heaven. The Navajo of North America believed that the god Sohanooi carried the sun on his back and at night hid it behind the west wall of his house. The Japanese believed that the moon was born from a tear shed by the god Dizanaji. But what science tells us about the birth of the solar system is also astounding. Five billion years ago, from a swirling mass of cloud, the sun was born. At its center, the heat and pressure triggered a nuclear explosion that has been going on ever since, the source of the sun's energy. At the same time, the outside of the cloud began to form into the planets, dense rocky ones nearest the sun, and at the far reaches, much bigger creations, mostly made of gas. The sun with the nine planets orbiting around became our solar system. The sun is big enough to hold more than a million Earths. From the surface, raging at over 10,000 degrees Fahrenheit, giant solar flares leap tens of thousands of miles into space. Distances in space tax our imagination. A journey in a passenger jet from the sun to the outer limits of the solar system would take over 800 years. Even in a science fiction spacecraft traveling at the speed of light, the voyage would still take over five hours. To reach the nearest star would take four light years. Heading out from the sun, the first planet is the tiny, battered Mercury. A sphere of rock the size of our moon, Mercury is a planet of dramatic extremes. The sun's massive gravitational pull has robbed it of nearly all its atmosphere. During the day, the temperature quickly rises until it's hot enough to melt most metals as if they were wax. But at night, with no protective atmosphere, the temperature plummets until it's as cold as liquid nitrogen. The sun's gravity also attracts passing asteroids and meteors. Close by, Mercury gets battered and scarred with huge craters. Mercury only takes 88 Earth days to orbit the sun, giving it the shortest year in the solar system. But it spins on its axis so slowly that its day, strangely, lasts twice as long as its year. Since the orbit is so short, it passes through our night sky with great haste. So in the Roman pantheon, Mercury was the messenger of the gods, a symbol of agility and speed. Viewed from the Earth, the planets helped to govern our sense of time. The solar system provided a calendar to tell early humans when to sow the seed and when to reap the crop. For travelers and sailors, too, a knowledge of the heavens provides a reliable direction finder. With eyes as their only telescopes and minds as their only calculators, ancient people still managed to map and record the heavens. 6,000 years ago, the Chinese made detailed records, data that still used today. 
They predicted celestial events of great significance to the emperor and his court, phases of the moon, the positions of the planets and eclipses, all with unerring accuracy. They had to. The punishment for being wrong was instant execution. In early cultures, the astronomer was half scientist, half magician. After all, someone who could predict when and where the sun would rise could surely foretell other events. Astrology, fortune telling from the positions of the stars and planets still thrives. Even monarchs and political leaders have consulted astrologers when making important decisions. The second planet out from the sun is Venus. Named for the Roman goddess of love, it is a symbol of all that is gentle. It's the brightest planet seen from the Earth, often visible at dawn and dusk. It's been called the morning star, the evening star, the dragon star, the witch star. But the beauty of Venus is deceptive, with conditions more awesome than any dragon, more terrifying than any witch. Its brightness comes from a toxic atmosphere reflecting the sun's light, a mixture of carbon dioxide and sulfuric acid. The planet suffocates in an extreme form of the greenhouse effect. A computer can simulate a flyby of the surface of Venus which is whipped by colossal storms with hurricane speed winds and a rain of burning acid. Lava flows come from what appear to be permanently active volcanoes, a brimstone and sulfur world, the nearest you can get to hell. Land a familiar object on Venus and it would not last very long. Acid rain and extreme temperature would burn holes through the metal. Before long, high winds would blow it away. A real challenge for an exploring probe. Only one has survived long enough to transmit data back to Earth. A Russian probe was specially strengthened to withstand the awful conditions. Even so, it lasted no more than an hour. The Earth is about the same size as Venus, not much further from the Sun. So why don't we fry in lava flows and choke on sulfuric clouds? Part of the answer is on Earth there's life. Four billion years ago, the Earth was much like Venus, with immense volcanic activity shrouded in carbon dioxide and water vapor. But as the Earth matured, the water vapor cooled, and it rained. Rain enough to create the oceans, the birthplace of primitive life forms. These microscopic creatures began to break down carbon, the essential ingredient from which all life is made, releasing oxygen into the atmosphere. This began to work as a heat control, so avoiding the extremes of temperatures found on Mercury and Venus. The Earth's surface now teems with life. Life has shaped the planet that has made our atmosphere and covered our land masses with forests and cities. Life has done more than colonize Earth. It has become part of its very structure. Humans had no way of seeing the beauty of planet Earth until we saw it from space, one of the most compelling sights in the universe. It has even moved astronauts to tears. Long before humans had ventured into space, movie makers were acting out fantasies of space travel. Careful, Flash, they're turning for an attack. Throw it every face. Flash Gordon, Buck Rogers, and many others thrilled a whole generation with their adventures. Yes, it's our only chance to save them. But not until 1961, when the Russian cosmonaut Yuri Gagarin orbited the Earth, did fantasy begin to become reality. So far, the moon is the only extraterrestrial site in which humans have set foot. In 1969, Apollo 11 took Neil Armstrong and Buzz Aldrin on their half a million mile round trip. Okay, all flight controllers, go to go for landing. Retro. Go. Fido. Go. Guidance. Go. Capcom, we're go for landing. Eagle Houston, you're go for landing. Over. Contact light. Okay, engine stop. We've had shutdown. 
Tranquility Base here. The Eagle has landed. That's one small step for man, one giant leap for mankind. There have been six moon landings, during which astronauts collected rock samples, took photographs, played golf, and easily showed that moon gravity is one-sixth that of Earth's. Because the moon has no atmosphere, there is no wind and no rain. So the footprints which those astronauts left behind may remain undisturbed for thousands of years. The moon completes one orbit of the Earth in just over 27 days, the same time it takes to rotate on its own axis. So we never see the dark side of the moon. Perhaps that's why it's always been shrouded in mystery. It's a potent symbol of romance, it is said that if two lovers plight their troth beneath a full moon, they will stay together forever. But the full moon also brings werewolves and witches out of their lairs. <laughs> From time to time, the earth and moon line up so that sunlight casts a shadow of the moon across the earth, creating a solar eclipse. At a fixed point on Earth, the total eclipse of the Sun will occur only once every 360 years. And they're still greeted with great superstition. Chinese celebrations try to scare away the dragon that, according to legend, has devoured the Sun. Celestial events are often linked to ancient monuments, like Stonehenge in southern England. Only at dawn on a midsummer's day do the stones align exactly with the rising sun. Today there are better ways of studying the movements of the planets. The modern observatory allows astronomers to look deep into space. But even the most sophisticated optical telescopes are hampered by the Earth's atmosphere. The best solution is a telescope in space. The Hubble telescope is just that. Launched in 1990, it provides photographs of the stars and planets, which are valuable for their detail, as well as majestically beautiful. Out beyond Earth, we come to the planet that more than any other has held hope for life other than our own, Mars. It was an Italian astronomer, Giovanni Schiaparelli, who more than a hundred years ago first noticed a pattern of unnaturally straight lines on the surface of Mars. He speculated that they may be great canals built by Martians. We now believe that he wasn't seeing canals at all, just a fault with his telescope. But ever since, Mars has fueled the thought that we may not be alone. By the 1930s, it was a popular myth that there were little green men living on Mars and all set to invade Earth. And a fake report of Martian landings caused mass panic when it began an American broadcast of the novel War of the Worlds. But in one sense, we are under constant invasion from Mars. In 1996, in the wastelands of Antarctica, scientists discovered a chunk of Martian meteorite. Embedded in the rock was what could be microscopic fossils of bacteria. Perhaps, millions of years ago, there was life on Mars. There is almost certainly no life on Mars now. It is a cold, barren world with a temperature which rarely rises above freezing. Like Earth, Mars has water, as low mists in the deep valleys are locked into the ice caps at the poles. There are huge volcanoes, including the highest mountain in the solar system, Olympus Mons, two and a half times the size of Mount Everest. Violent storms engulf the entire planet for months on end.
first probe to make a soft landing on Mars was ripped to pieces by the wind in just 20 minutes. Named for the Roman god of war, Mars appears a blood-red color and has always been linked with anger and conflict. People born under its influence are supposed to be fiery and hot-headed. In fact, the red coloring comes from iron oxide, better known as rust. Far from being the bloodthirsty, heroic god of war, Mars is just quietly rusting away. Although forbidding, it seems to be the only planet that carries any promise of supporting a human colony. The ambitious plan would be to remodel the planet by a process known as terraforming. The theory is that if primitive life forms were to be introduced, they could adapt the atmosphere and eventually make the planet habitable. The process would take thousands of years, but if it worked, we'd end up with a place in space just like home. Beyond Mars lies the asteroid belt, billions of fragments of rock that some scientists believe are left over from the birth of the solar system. Fragments are sometimes dislodged from their orbit, traveling as far as the Earth, where they enter the atmosphere and burn up, leaving a bright trace through the sky, a meteorite or shooting star. Some meteorites make it to the surface. This crater more than half a mile wide in Arizona was thought to be caused by a boulder 160 feet across. And in 1972, a huge meteorite grazed the atmosphere. Had this fireball hit the Earth, it would have exploded with the force of five atomic bombs. The asteroid belt marks the limit of the inner rocky planets. Go beyond size and distance can hardly be conceived in earthly terms. We are now in the realm of the gas giants. Jupiter, named after the king of all Roman gods, is the biggest planet in our solar system. The first sightings of Jupiter led to a revolution in thought. In the 16th century, the Christian church had the fixed idea that humankind and the earth should be at the center of everything. But the Polish scientist, Nicholas Copernicus, began to believe that the Sun, and not the Earth, was the center of the solar system. Fearing reprisals from the Church, Copernicus delayed publishing his theories until he was on his deathbed. But his ideas were taken up by an Italian astronomer, Galileo Galilei. He made a study of Jupiter and its moons, and it was the orbits of these moons that convinced him that the planets orbited the sun. Facing torture for his radical ideas, he publicly recanted, saying that the Earth is motionless, but in his heart, he believed in an orbiting Earth. His dying words were, but it does move. Twelve more moons of Jupiter have been discovered since Galileo's day, making 16 in all. Everything about Jupiter is on a massive scale. The Earth could fit inside it 1,300 times. It has two and a half times the mass of all the other planets put together. These real pictures show the giant wind systems that drive gas around the planet in bands, rotating in alternate directions. The Great Red Spot is in fact the eye of an immense hurricane, raging for at least 300 years. Jupiter's rocky core is about twice as big as the Earth, but it's an inferno, raging at more than 60,000 degrees Fahrenheit where hydrogen is compressed until it behaves like metal. If Jupiter was much bigger, the heat and pressure would trigger nuclear fusion. It would no longer be a planet, but a star. In some ways, Jupiter seems to defy our understanding of nature. 
as befits the Lord of the Gods, Jupiter, goes its own way. Though Galileo correctly worked out the orbits of the planets, he had no idea how they did it, what kept them there, suspended in space. The answer came to the English scientist, Isaac Newton, according to legend while seated under an apple tree. The apple fell to Earth because of a force which he called gravity. All bodies in space exert this force, and the bigger the body, the greater its gravity. Fired with enough speed, an apple can escape the Earth's gravity and go flying off toward the stars. But at a certain height, the apple remains in balance. Too far to fall, too close to escape. It would go into orbit around the Earth. When Newton discovered gravity, he had discovered the force that keeps the planets orbiting the sun. And it is gravity which creates some of the breathtaking spectacles of astronomy, like the rings of Saturn. These posed another great mystery to early astronomers. Galileo thought he was looking at three planets, a large one flanked by two smaller ones. Only a more powerful telescope could correctly identify the rings. Though they look solid, they're made of nothing more than ice cubes, from tiny crystals to lumps the size of a refrigerator. All of the gas giants have rings, but Saturn's are the brightest, easily visible from Earth. Like Jupiter, Saturn is mostly gas. It's a featherweight, with a density so low it would float in your bath. If you had one planet-sized, It also has more moons than any other planet. Eighteen have so far been discovered. The gravity of two of them has the effect of braiding the inner ring in a sort of celestial dance. The strange beauty of the planets has led to some fanciful notions. According to Pythagoras, the Greek mathematician, the perfection of the planet's spherical shape must extend to their sound. He believed that the planets sing in their orbit making the most perfect harmony, the music of the spheres. Many of the great astronomers were also accomplished musicians. William Herschel was a music teacher with only an amateur's interest in astronomy. Outraged by the cost of telescopes, he built one of his own, enabling him in 1781 to discover a whole new planet. He named his new planet Georgius Sidum, after the English king, George III. But when the king lost his wits, it was decided that the blameless planet should carry, rather than the name of a mad monarch, the name of a Roman god. Uranus, the personification of heaven, the seventh planet out from the sun. Further observations of the new planet revealed irregularities in its orbit. Scientists worked out that its movements must be caused by another body. In 1846, astronomers finally found the eighth planet exactly where they expected. They named it after the Roman god of the sea, Neptune. Uranus and Neptune are often described as sister planets even though the two gas giants are ten times more distant from each other than the Earth is from the Sun. Uranus is almost featureless, like a great green billiard ball floating in space. The surface of Neptune is broken by patches of white, clouds and storm systems in the atmosphere. Its blue coloring comes from the presence of methane gas. Just as Neptune has its effect on the orbit of Uranus, an even more distant planet was thought to be affecting the orbit of Neptune. Percival Lowell, an American astronomer, searched the skies, but he didn't spot the planet on his photographs. He was looking for something huge, the size of a gas giant. It was not until 1930 that fuzzy, indistinct pictures finally led to the identification of the ninth planet. It turned out to be a small, rocky planet. 
It's so distant that even the Hubble Space Telescope can barely see it. The new find caught the public imagination. Suggested names for it included Atlas, Osiris, even Constance after Lowell's wife. Eventually a name from an 11-year-old schoolgirl from Oxford, England was adopted. Pluto, after the Roman lord of death and god of the underworld. On the very edge of our solar system, Pluto is so far from the sun that it is a cold and barren world. Its thin atmosphere of nitrogen and methane may freeze completely in winter and fall as pale blue snow. It's about as unattractive a place for human life as can be imagined. Although a visit by us is not likely, a round trip from Earth would take at least 30 years. Its single moon, Charon, was not discovered until 1978, and many of the mysteries of Pluto were still out there, waiting to be discovered. Few believe that any planets exist beyond Pluto. At the outermost reaches of the solar system, it is a wasteland of small planetoids. It's the trash dump of the solar system, where pieces left over after the formation of the planets finally came to rest. Beyond the edge of our solar system is the vast emptiness of deep space. Light from the sun takes five and a half hours to reach here, but it takes over four years to reach the next closest star. And the furthest known star in the universe is a staggering 15 billion light years away. Our Earth once seemed the center of the universe, bigger than the sun. Now we know that it's but a tiny blue gem floating in space and time. to power you through the toughest jobs. And with an available fourth door, you've got lots of room for all your other tools. And friends to help you use them. At home or on the job site. For work or play. It's no wonder we at Home Time count on Silverado, the truck, to get the job done. Silverado, from Chevy. The most dependable, longest lasting trucks on the road. I will be explaining what's called platform framing. Once all the foundation's in, you begin by building a platform for the first floor. The first lumber to go on top of the foundation is called the sill plate, or the mud plate. For us, this is going to be a 2x6 made of pressure-treated wood, so that it won't decay if it absorbs any moisture from the concrete. Now we have to drill holes in it for the anchor bolts. We use a combination square to transfer the position of the bolts onto the wood and we measure to mark the distance in from the edge of the foundation for each bolt. The bolts are half inch in diameter. We use a 5 8 inch drill bit, which will give us a little room to position the plate accurately. Before we install the sill plate, we roll out a fiberglass sill sealer. This will seal up any gaps between the concrete of the foundation and the wooden plate. We use washers, nuts, and a wrench with a deep socket to tighten the sill plates down, and we toenail the plates together at the corners. Depending on your local building codes, you'll need anchor bolts every six or eight feet along the sill and within 12 inches of the end of any piece. Your foundation contractor should already know what's required in your area. The framing pieces that provide the structural support for a floor are called joists. The joists that run along the perimeter are the rim joists. You can use regular lumber for your joists like 2x10s, but more and more builders are using engineered products like these wooden I-beams. Your architect, lumber yard, or building department will be able to help you figure out what size lumber or engineered joist and what spacing you need given your spans and weight loads. 
The beams get toe-nailed into the sill plate with eight-penny cement-coated nails. They also get nailed to each other at the corners. Before we install the interior joists, we have to mark the spacing for them. The center of the first joist goes 16 inches from the outside edge of the first rim joist. After that, the rest of the joists go 16 inches center to center. This is so that the first sheet of subfloor, which will be 8 feet long, will run from the outside of the framing to the middle of the floor joist. To make your framing go faster, you might want to get a pneumatic nailer and a compressor to run it. In our area, you can run a basic outfit for about $120 a week. I'll make sure you get complete instructions for using it. Well, once your joists are in place, you'll probably have to put some blocking between them to keep them from twisting and to stiffen up the whole floor system. You can use solid blocking, as we've done here, or cross bridging. The bridging pieces are 1x3s, specially cut to fit diagonally between the joists. Two go in between each pair of joists on either side of the chalk line guide, forming a cross. One end nails to the top of the joist and the other to the bottom of its neighbor. We just nail the tops in now. We'll nail the bottoms later when we get the full weight of the addition on these joists. Let's learn about the next step in framing, installing the subfloor. About all set there? Yep, ready. Okay, up on this. Well, we're using three quarter inch oriented strand board. It has a tongue and groove in it, and we're attaching it to the decking using construction adhesive and nails. Now watch out for your fingers there, all right? Okay, let's put this down first. Okay, that side. Yep. All right. And I'll, I'll grab this. You ready? Yep, I'm dry. With tongue and groove subfloor, you may need to beat the sheet snugly into place. Do this on the groove side and use a scrap piece of wood to protect the edge of the sheet. When you put down the subfloor, you should straighten out any bows in the joists. The way to do this is to measure out the joist spacing on the sheets of subfloor, the same way we did along the rim joists. Then line the joists up to these marks before we nail them down. To start, we only nail the subfloor down along the edges, but once we're done, we come back and snap chalk lines over the joists. This makes it real easy to run along the lines with a power nailer and secure the sheets in the middle. These are eight penny cement coated nails and they go every four inches. Now, we're ready to lay out the first exterior wall. We're marking the top and bottom plates where the studs will go and the openings for the windows and doors. And the first one is two feet eleven and a half inches from the wall okay. out to the beginning of the rough opening. Two feet eleven. Two feet eleven and a half inches. Got it. Then three feet two and three eighths inches for the rough opening. Okay. What was that again? Two, three feet, two and three eighths inches. There are basically two types of walls in a house, load-bearing and non-load-bearing walls, and they're built a little bit differently. The outside walls of a house are almost always load-bearing walls, like this one. So if you've got an opening for a window, you've got to support the wall above it. And for this, you'll need what's called a header. The header gets shorter studs to support it. These studs are called jack studs or trimmers. The studs on either side of those, the longer ones, are called king studs. Now, as you can tell, we've nailed the trimmer to the king stud before we set it in place. Your architect or draft person can size your header for you. Of course, the size will depend on how wide your opening is and the type of load the top of the wall has to carry. Now, our header, let's this out here, second one. Our header is made up of two two by sixes with a two by six nailed on the bottom to bring it out to the full width of our two by six wall. For basic framing, you use 16 penny cement coated nails, two into the end of each stud through the plate. We prefer using our regular 16 ounce hammers, but some folks like using a heavier 20 ounce framing hammer. Either way, it's pretty hard work. We'll switch over to an air nailer pretty soon. To finish off our window opening, we put a sill in across the bottom of our opening. This is supported by shorter cripple studs. We also nail cripples in between the header and the top plate. These cripples transfer the weight of the wall above the window onto the header. 
The studs above and below the window are on the standard 16 inch on center spacing, even though the trimmers may be spaced differently. Okay, should we slide, slide this over? Yeah. Well, once we have the wall all assembled, we slide it into position here, and then we'll nail it down to hold it in place okay. so we can square it up. Okay, let me just pull it over this way. Okay. 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 Right there, that should yep. do it. Now the trick to squaring a rectangular wall is to measure the two diagonals. If they're the same, then they're square. Okay, 166 and a quarter. That's good. Okay. 166 and a half. So we have to kick this over. Let's let's try that one. Okay. How's that? 166 I think that probably did it. Check yours. Probably. Then I'll go ahead and Yep, that's fine. Okay. I'll toll nail square. this in over here. So it stays, doesn't move around. Well, this is the sheathing we're going to be using. It's oriented strand board, basically the same thing we used for the subfloor, except this is only a half inch thick. It isn't three quarter like the subfloor. Now we built the first section wall over here, which is really part of a longer wall. So we went ahead and laid out this, this second section here. And uh, once we get all the sheathing down, we'll separate these apart. Say, we want uh, this flush up here on the top, don't we? Oh, that's right. We're going to leave the gap down on the bottom. Okay, okay right. that's right. Pull that up here. So we'll separate the two walls apart and then lift them independently because it'd just be way too heavy to try to lift the whole thing at once, which is a real common thing to do when you just have a couple people framing. the sheathing for this window opening so we laid it out so we wouldn't get one whole sheet over the opening. We take the tape measure, stick it underneath the sheathing all the way to the trimmer, take that measurement, 20 and a quarter, transfer that to the top, Okay. go down to the bottom and do the same thing, underneath, 20 and a quarter. Okay, now we want the top and bottom of the window opening. So that's 17. Transfer that up here. The other mark. Bottom, 29 and a quarter. 29 and a quarter. Okay, that should do it. Now we get the other sheet. So did you get this measurement over to the uh, edge of the window? Oh, yeah, I suppose we should do that. Okay. okay. That would be Is that 18? 18. And I'll just write that down up here, so we know that. Right. The same. If you want Need to grab the top there. Here. Okay. Right there? Should do it. We've got a little pocket on the end of this wall, so it's easier to nail the two walls in this corner. But before we put the sheathing on, we've got to make sure to get the insulation in here. Otherwise, it's impossible to get in there later. We've got gaps in the insulation, and you have a cold corner in the wintertime. Okay. This will help. Much better, much better. Well, we didn't nail down this middle piece of sheathing here because it's covering the joint between the two walls. So we'll move this over here now so we can lift up the wall. Okay, y'all set there, are the nails out? Yep. Okay, let's move this thing over. Which is, well, it does get heavy, doesn't it? Okay, you slide this one under here. Okay, up we go. Okay, how about right here? Okay, I'll grab down here. Okay, so we have our braces here, level, sledge. I think we're all set to go. Okay. One, two, three, lift! Okay. Oh. 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 Got it, got it. It's always heavier than you think, huh? Yeah. 
As we lift the wall, the bottom is held in position by the toenails. But as soon as we can, we accurately position the bottom and nail it into the deck, trying to drive the nail into the top edge of the rim joist. Then we attach some temporary braces from the top of the wall to a block nailed into the subfloor. You may also be able to nail the bottom of the brace to a rim joist. Before we secure the brace, we plumb the wall. Okay, Robin, this way just a little bit. A okay. little bit, a little bit more. Okay, right there. Okay, let me get this thing over here. Hold that in place there, Robin. Our next few walls will go in quickly, especially since we've switched over to the power nailer. These walls already have the cap plates attached okay, to them. Right the cap plate is an extra two by that goes on top of the wall. We always run the cap plates so that they cover the joints between wall sections. That's why it's usually simpler to put them on after the walls are up. Where two walls come together in a corner, you have to put in some special framing. You can see now that the extra studs and the blocking between them give you a surface to nail the adjacent wall into. It will also give you a surface inside on each wall to nail the drywall onto later on. In addition to making all the walls plumb, we also check any long walls and make sure that they're straight. All of this is so that our roof trusses will sit on the walls properly. We also need to fill in the missing sheathing at the bottom of our walls. This covers the gap at the bottom and the rim joists. Our rim joists are covered with foam insulation, so we have to use long nails to secure the sheathing. Now that's a quick look at exterior walls in new construction. But a lot of do-it-yourself framing involves interior walls in existing spaces, like a lower level. So here's how to build some of those. In this basement, we're building short walls out of 2 by 2s to go against the half-height block walls. We apply construction adhesive to the floor where the wall will sit. Okay, ready to go down. Then we tilt it up and use a powder-actuated nailer to drive special nails through the plate and into the concrete floor. We also nail small treated blocks across the ledge and into the exterior wall framing. This helps keep the top of the wall in place. In some spaces, you won't have room to tilt up walls. In that case, you'll have to put the pieces of the wall together in place. This is sometimes called stick framing. I snap the chalk line on the concrete floor where the framing will be, and I apply construction adhesive to the floor between the line and the wall. Then I set the bottom plate on the floor and secure it with a powder actuated nailer. I use a level and a straight 2x4 to mark the location for the top plate on the underside of the joist. I do this at both ends of the wall and then snap a chalk line between them. I nail the top plate up into the joist along this line. Now I'm ready for the studs. Since the flooring and the ceiling might not be straight and level, I measure the studs one at a time. I set the 2x4 on the bottom plate, mark where it crosses the top plate, and cut it off the mark. Then I hammer it into place and toenail it into the plates. I'm using 2x4s for this wall. A 2x4 wall is easier to insulate and install electrical in. But a 2x4 wall does eat up a little bit more floor space than a 2x2 wall. If you need to build non-bearing interior walls, you might be able to build these on the floor and tip them up. Build them about a quarter inch short so that there will be just enough clearance to tilt them into place. Even when they're built short, they still may need a little persuasion in some points to get them plumb. At other points, you may find yourself filling in with shims between the top of the wall and the underside of the joist. Where interior walls connect with the outside walls, you'll probably end up having to put some wood blocking between the studs to have something solid to attach the interior wall to. There we go. Now this wall isn't as long as the other one, but it is actually a bit heavier because we have openings in here for doors. And openings require headers. And headers make everything a little bit top heavy. Okay, I'm going to get the ladder. There you go. Now that we've looked at different ways to build new walls, let's look at some remodeling framing situations. 
Back at our first house, we're installing what's called a flush header to support the house above a section of exterior wall that we want to remove. All right, well this morning we've gotten to a point where we can start tearing out this exterior wall here. We cut an opening here, kind of as a rough door opening, to help us get out onto the deck easier. Well, we're eventually going to have to tear this whole wall out. And when we do, we'll have to create another way to support the house above it. So we're going to be putting in a new header across this opening. But before we do that, we put in this temporary wall here to support the second story while we're working on it. Okay. I've got it. All right, we cut our joists here short enough to accommodate our beams that will be running in this area right here. Now, we'll be setting those in one at a time, which is a lot easier nailing them all together and trying to muscle all of them up at one time. Okay, over the top there. The new header is made up of three long pieces of laminated lumber. The ends sit on the old exterior wall, and the first one gets nailed to the ends of the old floor joists. Then we position and secure the second and third pieces. If the new header runs perpendicular to the old joists, like we have here, then you'll need to use joist hangers to attach the ends of the joists to it. Just nailing through the header into the ends of the joists doesn't make a strong enough connection. This header is probably longer and stronger than on most do-it-yourself projects. Well, let's take a look at how to frame a smaller opening in an exterior wall. On this project, we're creating a window opening. We cut away the studs, leaving room at the bottom for a sill and at the top for a header. On this project, I was working with Joanne Liebler. We've already removed some of the siding on the outside. So now that the studs are cut, we can pry out the sections we need to remove. Our new header goes in next. This is a double 2 by 10. It's 47 and a half inches long to run the full distance between the existing old studs, even though our rough opening only needs to be 30 and a half inches. There we go. That's got one started over here. So. For the moment, a couple of nails through the studs hold the header in place. Sill. The new sill runs across the tops of the old studs that we cut down. It runs into the old studs at either end. Our next pieces form the sides of the rough opening. We put a single trimmer on the left side of the opening since it falls next to the old stud. On the right, we make sure to put in a double trimmer. Then we put in trimmers under the sill. It's very important that the weight of the load-bearing wall above the header gets transferred down to the floor and from the floor to the foundation. These studs below the sill do this for us. Before we cut the old siding out of the opening, we're going to secure it to our new framing. We've drawn a line on the outside that's three-quarters of an inch in from the edge of the opening. This way, our nails go into the center of the two-by-fours. Once the old sheathing is secure, we cut out the center. By running the reciprocating saw along the framing, we can cut the sheathing flush with the opening. Once the sheathing boards are out, we're ready for a window. Now the same techniques apply if you're creating an opening for an exterior door. Now let's get back to our main project and see how we install the second floor platform. Are the joists all set? Yep. Okay. Well, we're pretty much at the point now where we can start putting joists up here for the second floor. This board right here is the rim joist. This is what all the joists coming across here will end up butting into. You want to go ahead and hand one of those up here, Mark? Sure. And you notice we have all of our joists lined up, so they'll be right on top of our studs. Okay, Robin, you set? Sure. Over the top. 